Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when and where you are joining us from. Uh, welcome to VAT Compliance for Local Councils. So my name is John Fagan, and I have the pleasure to be hosting you today. I'm the CEO of Scribe. We pride ourselves in delivering top quality cloud software to town and parish councils. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over and give you the stage, Mr. Steve Parkinson. Thank you very much, John. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share my screen with you. First of all, apologise. There are lots of familiar names oh, because I don't know a big chunk of the local council sector. Um, so if you've been on any of my VAP courses before, you will recognise some of the slides because I reappropriate slides whenever I can rather than inventing a new one. So we're going to talk about VAT. Um, anybody who has been one of my VAP courses, this is about half the length, uh, and I'm going to focus on some of the issues that you've you've kind of identified. Um, uh, unfortunately, you ticked the right answers. You said the things I hoped you would say in terms of content. So dealing with VAT, first of all, VAT is a business tax. It doesn't apply to everything in sight. It applies to uh, when you make supplies of goods or services in return for payment. So selling stuff in the simple parlance. Uh, and many, we're, we're all familiar with this. We've all been shopping at some point. We're used to paying for something that we, we want to receive. Um, it's important to understand it is not a tax on profit. It's not corporation tax, it's not income tax. VAT applies regardless of how well your business is doing. You can lose money hand over fist. You can do something really uneconomic like buy something for a thousand pounds and sell it for a hundred pounds. VAT is still something that potentially applies on the sale of those items. So it's not about whether you make a profit, it's about whether you charge somebody for the thing that you're doing. And that's the kind of activity we need to look at as a council and say, are we undertaking business activities because the rules are different? And a very simple test at looking something to say, is this a business activity? So could somebody else do this? Could somebody else do this as their own business? Because they could they provide goods or services and get paid for that? and run it as a business, okay? If they can, then it's a good indication that it's a business activity going on. On the other hand, that probably doesn't describe most of what you do as a local authority. The vast majority of parish councils undertake what we call non-business activities. They're nothing to do with charging people for goods and services. Uh, they operate on a completely different mechanism. And John and I would love to have your mechanism because your mechanism for funding is you dip your hand in somebody else's pocket, whether they like it or not, and get all your funding. It's called taxation. Okay? It's a wonderful way of getting what you need to fund things, but it's not a business activity. People are not making a choice about whether they buy your goods and services. Uh, they don't necessarily use the things you provide, even though they have to pay for them. So it's a completely different way of funding the things that you do. As a local council, anything that you do, because you're required to, as a public authority, is non-business. So if you take the simplest thing that local authorities are required to do, parish council is required to do, you must meet. You must meet at least four times a year. And there are consequences of cost to doing that. You need a venue. Uh, if you don't own and maintain a venue, you need to hire one. So there's expenditure either way. You need members of staff to take the minutes. Uh, you need printing, uh, stationary equipment, computers to produce minutes, documents, notices. You need a notice board. You need a website, all the other kind of things. So those are costs of you just being a local authority doing the things you have to do by law, hold meetings and so on. Non-business activities include anything that you provide for free to the public. So the classic example, open spaces, parks. It's one of my favourite statistics for, for kind of the local authority sector. 25% of the UK population visit a park every week or will visit a park this week. So it's a significant service that a huge proportion of the population actually make use of on a regular basis. So that's a good, good example. You provide a park, you don't stand at the gate saying you're coming into the park, park that's 50p or whatever. So anything you provide for another good example, children's play areas. Now we just don't see people putting in expensive children's players and saying, right, it's a pound every time you bring your children. It doesn't work like that. They're freely available. So it, it's one of those things that people struggle with bizarrely. They don't seem to grasp that when you provide stuff for free, 
it's not a business activity normally. It's not relating to generating income. It's an entirely cost driven. We pay for this, you use the facility, and then we spend loads more money cutting the grass, cleaning the play area, so it's ready for you to do again tomorrow. So anything where you provide it for free, non-business. That does extend to certain of the things that we do charge for, but we charge for because we have to provide the services in a particular way. Sometimes we have to consider providing them. Sometimes we are stuck with them. Uh, sometimes we are required to charge in a particular way. The classic examples are allotments and burial grounds. Um, major features of those, virtually nobody else provides them on a big scale. Allotments are generally provided by local authorities. Burial grounds are generally provided by local authorities. Their control is completely regulated in legislation. So the Allotments Act tell you when, what you can do, when you can do it, how you can charge, when you can renew, and all those kind of things. If you're a private business, you wanted to an allotment, you completely ignore the Allotments Acts because they only apply to local authorities. Same thing applies with burial grounds. Again, the local authority cemeteries order, the clue is in the title. It only applies if you're a local authority. So as a local authority providing burial services, it's a non-business activity. And if you think about it, although you may charge for burials, if we have a year when nobody wants to be buried, nobody everybody suddenly changed to uh, decided to be cremated and scattered elsewhere, you still have to maintain the cemetery. You still have to keep it safe. You still have to maintain the footpaths and keep it decent for public access and so on. So um, you still have to look after these things even when they're not being used. So it's quite different from somebody running a business who might decide just not to carry on that business anymore. Those, those are, if you like, the two classic oddities where although we charge for those services, we can still treat it as non-business. The new one, uh, following uh, decisions earlier this year, we can treat the provision of sports facilities as non-business. HMRC were challenged in court. They have been, this challenge has been going on since 2010. It's, it's been kind of 12 years in the making. Um, HMRC lost the case, lost at appeal, uh, and gave up on their kind of final foothold as to a potential argument for kind of fighting the case. So we can now treat sports facilities as non-business as well, even when we charge for them. But we do need to be clear what we're talking about. Okay, so it, sports facilities means facilities for playing sport, something you use to actually play a sport. So for example, a football pitch, a cricket wicket, a bowling green, a tennis court. Um, sport in its widest sense, so it's not necessarily competitive sport. So for example, a swimming pool or something like that also counts as a sports facility, uh, whether you're swimming competitively or not. Okay, so if we are charging people to use those things, and it includes things like um, 3G pitches and stuff like that, if we're charging people to use those facilities, we can treat it as non-business. Okay, the caveat in that is as long as we are setting our fees with a mind to things like public health, um, ensuring uh, the less well-off can participate, ensuring that we provide for um, disabilities and very varying, varying levels of abilities, all the other things. So it's not simply the case that we provide sports facilities, but that in charging for them, we operate in a way that we're constrained by law because we have to consider things like the prevention of crime and disorder and all sorts of other things, public health, when we do things as a local authority. We, we need to be careful not to try and stretch sports facilities to cover things that it doesn't. So for example, if somebody is hiring a pitch and they get changing rooms along with their pitch so that they can change to play football, that's fine. That's part of their use of a sports facility. If we are providing things like a clubhouse or a club to use as their base of operations, not directly connected with them actually playing sport at a particular time, then we need to be careful because a clubhouse in itself, a meeting room, is not a sporting facility. Okay, so we need to be careful when we're treating sports as on business that it is actually a sports facility like a pitch or a tennis court or something that we are dealing with. Okay, and the final thing that we could treat as non-business, normally if you lease land to somebody in return for payment, that's a business activity. 
Okay, your customer pays, gets control of a piece of land for a period of time, and could anybody else do it? Of course they could. Any other landowner can lease their land or buildings to somebody else in return for payment. So normally, leasing land or buildings is a business activity. However, if we lease it for a pound or less, HMRC will accept that it's a non-business activity. A pound is not a reasonable value. It's a token, and a token that very often doesn't actually change hands in relation for land or building. So where essentially you are giving away a piece of land or building to somebody else to use, and you're only asking them for a nominal pound a year, then we can treat that as a non-business activity as well. Okay, that only applies to land. It doesn't apply to other things. So for example, if you sell sweets for a pound, it's still a business activity. It's only where we choose to allow somewhere to use land that we can apply that distinction. And if it was as simple as, and if it's a business activity, you charge VAT, thanks for coming, it would be really simple, wouldn't it? But it doesn't work like that. It's not an elegant souffle either, certainly. I think you're all right in identifying that. So our first test, when we look at an activity your council is doing is, is it business or non-business? Okay, if it's free, we don't charge anybody, we don't get any income, it's easy, it falls in the non-business category, it shouldn't be hard to think about. If, on the other hand, we do make charges to other people, so, um, and it's not something we can hang on a peg that says, we do this because we're a local authority, like allotments or burial grounds, if we're charging for something else, and it's a business activity, we have another test to do, and that is, is it a taxable activity? Because not everything is. Okay, is it, is it something we would have to charge VAT on if we were back registered? Or is it exempt from VAT and nobody charges VAT on it? It's really important that we get this bit right and get this distinction right because whether we can reclaim VAT, whether we have to reclaim VAT, sorry, whether we have to register for VAT, uh, how we charge, whether we have to provide an invoice, all kinds of things are driven by, does it fall into the taxable or the exempt category? So determining where it falls is really, really important when you're charging somebody for things. Uh, and the best point to decide whether it's taxable or exempt is long before you start doing it. Okay, we get quite a few queries through our county association clients where somebody has done something um, for example, we've just had one in May, somebody was doing a bit like a, a run where you pay an entry fee, uh, which contributes to the price. And they've already done it, they've already charged people to join, and now they've come along and said, could we have charged VAT on this? You know, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit late at that point. If you were running a shop and you sold all the goods in the shop and then said, should I have charged VAT on that? It's going to make a big difference to your profit. So it's really important to you know before you start doing stuff that we know where exactly that falls. How do we know? Well, the VAT rates are set out in the VAT Act and the default position is quite simple. The default position is if you make a supply of goods and services in the United Kingdom, it's standard rated by 20% VAT unless you can hang it on something in one of the schedules that says it isn't. Okay? And there are three schedules that set out different rates uh, or different ways that uh, VAT applies. We're quite lucky in the UK. Some European countries have six different VAT rates and not all of them include zero. So they have six different things to think about which category things fill into. So it's slightly simpler for us, but not simple by any stretch of anybody's imagination. So schedule A is reduced rate, 5% VAT. You probably won't make any VAT supplies that are, uh, sorry, any taxable supplies that are at the re reduced rate as a local council. The only one you'll like to find is if you supply metered electricity to somebody below about a thousand kilowatt hours a month, that would be at 5%. But there's very little that you'll like to come across um, that you will be supplying stuff at the 5% rate. Good late is zero rated. It's a taxable supply and the rules for taxable supply supply but the rate of tax is actually zero. Um, 
things that you might supply or encounter, uh, selling the written word, so newspapers, books, magazines, publications, anything pr with printed words on paper, generally zero rated if it's just providing information. Tap water, zero rated, um, but bottled water isn't. So we get lots of little oddities. You have to be very specific about what you're supplying to make sure you get the right answers in these kind of cases. Uh, advertising, if you provide advertising, advertising for charities, is zero rated. Standard rate of anybody else, but zero rated if it's for charity. The key one though for us is schedule nine, exempt supplies. Uh, and the reason it's a key one is because the most likely way that a parish council will generate extra revenue apart from its precept is to charge people to use its land and to use its buildings. Okay, so things like room hire, leases of buildings, those kind of activities. So that's the, the kind of area we need to be very careful about um, when we are looking at, and I'm going to kind of deal with land in kind of the last, the last half of the session because it's the complex area and we're going to build up for that. Okay, so there's, there is lots of VAT guidance. VAT guidance is all available on .gov.uk. People say they can't find VAT guidance. If you go to .gov.uk and type in VAT, it will spew out far more than you need. Um, but we'll talk about the kind of key ones. Um, I did, did forget to say at the bottom of the first slide, VAT notice 749, local authorities and similar bodies. Again, the clue is in the title. That is the only VAT notice that takes any notice of the fact that local authorities exist. So that's the one you need to follow as a local authority and make sure that the rules apply, uh, that you apply the rules correctly. So we're going to move on. So having identified different rates, we're going to look at what taxable supplies are. The most, we're going to look at the most common taxable supplies that catch councils out. And this is based, this is based on seven years of having councils come and say, should we be registered for VAT? And in some cases, having to say, yes, you should have registered for VAT a very long time ago. OK, so why is it important? Why, why, is it, why are taxable business activities important? Well, first of all, when you're making taxable supplies, if your council is not registered for VAT, and we estimate that that probably applies to about 90% of parish councils, if you're not registered for VAT, you cannot reclaim VAT, making taxable supplies, unless you're actually registered. If you do make significant taxable supplies, you may need to register for VAT. We're going to look at those on the next uh, two slides, I think. So common activities that catch people, probably the most significant ones, things like bars, it's running things where you regularly sell and kind of quite high, high volume of sale, like bars, cafes, catering. Um, for a local council, um, an efficient bar or cafe can result in you needing to register after about a month or so. Yeah, if you, if you have kind of volume coming over the, over the counter in terms of payments, it's going to be quite quick. If you provide catering either from a kitchen or catering for functions and events and things like that, taxable supplies. If you sell goods, particularly things like souvenirs, again, selling goods generally, taxable supplies. So uh, we've had loads of questions about um, coronation mugs, which has been exactly the same question as we had for Jubilee mugs over the, um, the, the silver, gold, diamond, and platinum Jubilees. And indeed, we had for Millennium mugs all those years ago and all the other things. So if you're selling goods, it's a taxable business activity. I've already mentioned advertising for charities. Advertising for anybody else is, is a taxable business activity. Uh, and that can include, for example, advertising on your website, advertising in your uh, parish magazine, uh, advertising on notice boards, bus shelters, and things like that. So anything where you're offering a supply of advertising normally a taxable supply. Other areas that catch people out, events, um, things like big firework events, big music concerts and things like that. Uh, very often councils don't realise that that may lead them to having to register for VAT and charge VAT on their ticket sales. And very often these, they, they kind of drift into these. Um, very often we see somebody organises a, a small fireworks event and it's very successful and everybody likes it and says, oh, we must do this again. And then maybe the next year they say, maybe we could ask people for donations and shake a bucket or something. 
And then they get some money and think, oh, we could start charging for this. I think people would pay. And they start charging for their firewood event without realizing that may affect their ability to reclaim VAT when they make taxable supplies. And they may also need to register for VAT. And we've done uh, two in the last year uh, relating to fireworks events and similar things where uh, the council has had to go back 10 years or more because it should have registered and it should have been paying probably a thousand to two thousand pounds a year uh, to HMRC for um, the VAT on its firework event alone. Another area that catches people, uh, and to be honest, when, when I started the clock, it was something that caught my council, hanging baskets. If you provide hanging baskets around the town and you hang them from lampposts or you put flower planters over railings and stuff, it's lovely. Um, if you get donations, that's great. If you provide sponsorship and people put their advert all over those features, that's a supply of advertising. However, what we often see is people ask local businesses, local shops to pay for a hanging basket or two. Uh, and very often they pay to have a bracket outside their shop with a hanging basket on it. Okay. And there's a clear supply there. I can walk down your high street and I can look and say, yeah, that shop's paid for two hanging baskets. And that shop's paid for a hanging basket. That one didn't pay for any. They haven't got any. That one didn't pay for any. That one's paid for three hanging baskets. So there is a supply going on in return for that payment. Businesses that pay for the hanging basket get however many hanging baskets they want outside to beautify their shop, brighten it up, et cetera. So generally it's a lease of equipment because very often they don't want to keep the hanging basket. You know, when all the flowers die, they want you to take it away and say, thank you very much, I'm done with it. But it is hire of equipment and it will be a taxable supply in those circumstances. Um, Small council may not be an issue, but larger councils, it's not unusual to get three, four, five thousand pounds from people paying to put hang it, paying you to put their hanging baskets up, et cetera. So another area that does sometimes catch councils out, they think they're not making any business supplies, they don't have any taxable business activities, and suddenly they realize that that is actually what. Again, it doesn't matter whether the payment covers the cost of providing the hanging baskets or not. The question is, do you supply something? Do they pay for it? Other areas, parking. Um, when I used to do it, it's a, lot, it's a while since I've done face-to-face -face VAT courses. The last one was at the beginning of 2019, uh, 2020, uh, just before COVID, COVID had its impact. Um, but for kind of most of my first 10, 12 years uh, at, at local council level, people were asking about the decision in the Isle of Wight case. The Isle of Wight went all the way to the Supreme Court fighting to try and get their parking uh, off-street parking accepted as a non-business activity that they didn't have to account for VAT on. Um, the courts uh, decided against them. So when you provide car parking, it's a taxable supply. Uh, that, and, and the description is such that it's the facilities for parking a vehicle. So even if you lease land to somebody else to park a vehicle on um, or to use as a car park, it's a taxable supply. The same applies for boat moorings, if you provide those. Again, we've had people who didn't realise they should be charging VAT in boat moorings and have needed to register for VAT. Weddings are something else catching. People that have room hire, which is normally VAT exempt, weddings are not just room hire, and I'll come to that in a moment. The other, and another area, that the, if you like, the final area that kind of people fall down on is Providing services that you normally provide, but providing some of them to somebody else for a fee. And the most common one is probably grass cutting. OK, so parish council, you get a parish council which cuts its parks and open spaces and the village green and the cricket wicket and everything else. And then somebody like the local church says, would you cut the cemetery as well? Or the local school says, well, could you cut our playing field while you're doing your site? And the council says, yeah, just give us a thousand pounds or whatever it is for doing it and we'll cut the grass. And they forget that. They're then making a supply of services in return for payment to somebody else. And that's another area where people get caught out or indeed hiring your staff out to other people for a period of time is also something that catches that. Okay. There may be, there may be others, but those are the most common ones that, that kind of catch local councils out. All right. Why does it matter? As I said, Reclaiming VAT was where it matters. When you're undertaking non-business activities, 
Section 33 of the VAT Act allows you to reclaim VAT on those activities. So the free stuff that you do, your allotments, cemeteries that you charge for, and your sports facilities that you charge for. Uh, and that's simply because when VAT was introduced in the UK, and uh, we're going back the best part 50 years, uh, somebody, possibly Margaret Thatcher actually, promised that it would not have an effect on the ratepayer, as was or the council taxpayer now. So we've always had a mechanism whereby local authorities can reach VAT that they incur when providing services for residents as part of their council tax. If you're not that registered, you cannot reclaim VAT on your taxable business activities unless you actually register. Okay, and the converse, um, if you're VAT registered, obviously you can reclaim the VAT on you incur, but you have to charge VAT to the customers. That brings on to the question, do we have to register for VAT as soon as we start making supplies? Uh, the law is extremely stark and clear and unhelpful. It's about as unhelpful as the old rule where uh, taxes, in taxes in London are still supposed to carry a, 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 a bundle of hay in the boot to feed the horse, which really hasn't been an issue for about the last 100 years. The law says if a council makes any taxable supplies, it's liable to be registered for VAT. So if you think about it, if you sold a, a zero rated book for two pounds, you're liable to be registered for VAT. HMRC, of course, are not going to bother about the fact that you've sold a book for two pounds and it's not going to make them any money. It's really not worth their effort to make you register for VAT. They have a slightly more pragmatic approach. They will only enforce that registration if the VAT that you would charge to customers would exceed a thousand pounds per annum. Okay, so assuming most of your sales will be at 20% VAT, that's kind of 5,000 pounds worth of sales, which would attract a thousand pounds of VAT. So 6,000 pounds of income in total from things on the previous slide, um, like bars, cafes, catering, advertising, event admissions, and things like that. The important thing is the £85,000 VAT registration, registration threshold does not apply to you as a local council. Local authority is the only body in the country that don't get the generous £85,000 threshold before they have to register. And that's because Section 33 already allows you to reclaim loads more VAT than anybody else would be able to do. So Section 42 nails it down and says, you have to register if you start making regular taxable supplies. Okay, so how to, because several people have obviously picked that um, actually reclaims and returns are an issue. So we're gonna, we're kind of the basis of when you're entitled to first, we'll look at the actual reclaims themselves uh, at the end. So there are some steps you must fulfill to be able to reclaim VAT as non-business. Although it has to be said, you have to fulfill pretty much the same steps if you're making taxable supplies, charging VAT, and you want to reclaim stuff. So the council must have placed the order. It doesn't have to be like a paper order, but there must be a trail that shows that the council made a decision to acquire the goods or services, instructed the person that they're buying from to provide those services, et cetera. So, so some mechanism that shows that it was the council that ordered the goods and services, not somebody else like a, a local association or the scouts or somebody like that. The council must receive the supply of goods or services that they are actually paying for. Okay, so you must you must be the uh, the customer, if you like. Even if you then are going to give stuff away to somebody else, you must be the customer that instructs the contractor, gets them to deliver their services, etc. You must have a tax invoice addressed to the council. And people get hung up on this one because legally, if a tax invoice is less than two hundred and fifty pounds in total you don't have to address it. If, it's a, if you're a retailer or similar, uh, you're supplying small stuff, you do not have to write out the name and address of your customer if you're selling something for £10, for example. You, as long as you give them a, a simplified invoice which has all the right information, which is, this is who we are, this is our VAT number, 
this is what we're charging you and this is how much VAT it includes. So very, very basic. Um, then as long as you've got that, then uh, you've got all you need uh, to be able to reclaim the VAT. As long as you are paying from your own funds. Okay, so it's council money. However it got to you, it can include grants and things awarded to the council. But we need to be careful. It's not we're not actually buying goods on behalf of somebody else and trying to reclaim the fat back for them. Okay. Just an aside on on the on the tax invoice because because the fun question was a food question. Um, if you if you want a really good example of a tax invoice with a, a simplified tax invoice with everything on it, McDonald's actually do very clear tax invoices that set out exactly what they're charging you. Um, and if you ever make the one p donation to round it up that is clearly shown as an exempt donation to charity as well in their receipt. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not giving awards for the food, uh, but in terms of getting their receipt right, it does have all the right information. So another area we need to be careful with, uh, and I'm keeping my eye on the time as well, is grants and donations. Money coming from somebody else. And we need to be careful. If somebody gives you money to deliver your project, that's great. For example, if a council wants to do up a, a sports pavilion and it gets a grant from Sport England or it gets SIL money or it gets funding from the county district or unit of council, that's great. And you're using it to provide your facilities. We, what we need to be careful of is when somebody else gives you money as a council and wants you to do something for them. Okay, the classic example, I had two yesterday, is the village hall. The village hall, completely separate from the council, completely separate charity, doesn't want to pay VAT on their goods, so they ask the council to buy their goods for them. The council can claim its VAT back and the village hall will then give them the net amount. Okay, you're not allowed to do that. If the government had wanted charities to be able to reclaim VAT, they would have implemented it years ago. So if you're treating something as non-business and somebody else is giving you the money, you must remain the owner of anything that you buy. You must use whatever you buy or whatever you pay for for the council's non-business purposes. And you mustn't do something in return for the person that gave you the money. Okay. If you do, you're likely to be making a supply of services to them in return for the payment that they make to you. So that might mean you're making a taxable supply of services and you need to charge VAT or possibly register for VAT. It might mean that you're making an exempt supply of services and you may not be able to recover the VAT. There are some limited things you can do. For example, if Sport England do give you a million pounds towards a new pavilion, it's perfectly acceptable to have a plaque saying this was funded by Sport England. If somebody gives you 500 quid towards your Christmas event, it's quite reasonable to say in the programme, this was only possible with generous donations from X, Y and Z. But you shouldn't give them a full page advert in return for their contribution because that's a supply of advertising. Similarly, if Sport England do give you the money, um, they are not paying you a million pounds for a quarterly report on what you've done with their money. That would be silly. Yeah. So um, comply, having to comply with certain conditions to get a, a big grant is not unusual. OK, so I said land is a complicated area and I've left myself about five minutes or so to kind of get through this. So I've paired up five examples of where. Um, we need to look at land. So land normally, supplies of land, leases of land, grants, rights over land are normally exempt from VAT. No VAT is charged on them. We have to contrast that with things like event admission. If somebody is paying to come to an event, they're not getting one square metre of land where they have to stand for the entire duration. They're not getting a supply of land in that way. They are just paying to come in and they're paying to listen to the music, watch the film or whatever it may be, not to occupy a space. So that's not an exempt supply of land. It's a taxable supply of something else. Room hire. 
uh, a grant of land includes walls, floors, and anything else on that land. It's kind of the passive use of whatever is already stood there. As I said earlier, weddings, um, weddings were tested in court. Weddings are not treated as room hire uh, because the primary thing you need is a license. So it's not the room itself. It's the fact you've got a license is kind of crucial, but also the fact that the registrar has rights of access over that room while it's being used for a wedding. The public have a right of access. So it's not exclusive use of a room and it doesn't fall within the exemption. Again, markets, if you simply provide somebody with a bare piece of land and say, put your stall on there, it's exempt from VAT. But if we start supplying something more substantial, like here's a stand, here's a canopy, or as I dealt with a couple of weeks ago, here are some lovely wooden cabins for your Christmas market stall. If you're hiring out equipment, that's a taxable supply of equipment rather than a right over. Same applies to car boot sale pitches. Even though a car boot sale just looks like an off-street car park, car boot pitches are exempt, whereas the parking, the provision of parking is taxable. Uh, and I've said about mooring, so if you have a houseboat, which means a boat which can't be moved under power uh, and can't be readily adapted for an engine, that's exempt, but moorings are taxable for leisure boats and stuff. And VAT, exempt VAT activities are really important because they affect your ability to reclaim VAT. And I'm just going to kind of finish up on partial exemption here. So we've got plenty of tough questions. So parish councils can reclaim VAT when they undertake exempt for, for business activities. You don't need to be registered. You can include it in your VAT 126 claim. But you are limited. So only when it's a small amount of VAT that's fairly incidental. So the threshold is seven and a half thousand pounds per annum. So as long as the VAT that you incur on your exempt activities is less than seven and a half thousand pounds per annum, you can reclaim it. But if you go over, you can't reclaim any of it. So it's not claim seven and a half thousand and stop. It's if you're at seven thousand, you can reclaim it. If you're at eight thousand, that's eight thousand you cannot reclaim. Okay. That threshold has been the same since 1983. It was there before I started work. So you've seen this diagram once already, because I use it to split things up. So reclaiming VAT. To be able to work out whether you can reclaim your exempt VAT or not, we need to do what we call a partial exemption calculation. We split everything you do and the cost of everything you do into, is it non-business or is it business? And if it's business, we split it into taxable and exempt costs. Non-business, dead simple. If it's a non-business activity, you can reclaim all of the AT without limit. Doesn't matter if it's a million pounds, no problem there. If it's taxable, if you're not fact registered, you can't reclaim the cost of those activities and you may need to register. If you are registered, of course, you can reclaim that VAT, but you will need to be charging VAT to your customers. It's the other stuff. It's the cost of maintaining your VAT exempt activity. So the cost of maintaining your village hall, the cost of cleaning your market square, uh, the cost of providing a building that you lease out to somebody else. And when we do a partial exemption calculation, we are not interested in all the other costs. We'll ignore most of the costs of the council. We're only interested in the small area of cost where we maintain something that is used to generate VAT exempt income, like a village hall, a building that's leased out or whatever. And that's where the seven and a half thousand pound threshold comes in. And I'm looking at 11.45. So where does that come in? Where does that come in? For most councils, the vast majority of parish councils spend less than 50,000 pounds a year. They are rarely going to incur that kind of VAT on their day-to-day -day running of, of their facilities. It tends to come in when you do something big. Um, for example, if you build a clubhouse and it costs you half a million pounds, so that's a big chunk of VAT, and then you'd suddenly lease it to a football club for, for something silly like 500 pounds a year, because it counts as that, well, we ought to charge them something. Uh, 
In this particular case, doing that would lose the council the ability to reclaim 100,000 pounds of VAT because they're using the entire building and the entire cost of the building for a VAT exempt business activity. Um, I'm not gonna give you a solution to all of those kinds of situations in the next 15 minutes. What I would say is take advice. You're probably way out of your comfort zone. You're taking a big risk. Um, if you reclaim 100,000 pounds and get it wrong, HMRC can ask for it back, charge you interest for however many years it is since, since you took the sum and charge you a penalty as well for getting it wrong. So it's really important. First of all, you take advice to make sure you get it right and you know the options if there is a way to reduce the amount of VAT that you have to pay. Secondly, this is not the stage to take advice. When you've got a lovely new building standing there, the stage to take advice is before you dig a hole, before you put a brick on top of a brick, preferably when you're doing the drawings, ask at that point, can we reclaim the VAT on this activity? Okay. And I'm just gonna finish up on reclaiming VAT. So if you are not that registered, you need to submit form VAT126. You should have a 15 character reference for your council. I don't know why they can change from four characters to 15. Um, the entire population gets a tax reference with 10 digits and that covers 60 million people. But for some reason, they thought 10,000 parish councils needed a longer number. You should claim at least annually. You can claim for any complete calendar month as long as the claim is for more than £100. So if you suddenly have a big project, you can claim every month or every couple of months or whatever suits you. If you are VAT registered, you need to submit a quarterly VAT return by the due date. So normal quarters end, for example, the end of March, you need to produce a VAT return and submit it by the 7th of May. Since 2022, you have to submit that direct from your accounting software, okay? And most, most accounting software now is ready for that and can do that. And I know Scribe can do that because I've got customers that say we do this from Scribe and that's fine. So, but you need to be able to, basically you have all the right information in your accounts to start with, push a button and it submits that information direct to HMRC. And just my final point, there is a four year time limit going both ways. Um, uh, apparently VAT 126 still says three years, but it's four years and it has been four years since 2018. So they're just a bit slow updating the form. But if you do not spot a mistake or you fail to claim something for four years, you lose the ability to claim. And normally HMRC also lose the ability to pursue you for anything more than four years old, but there are some exceptions. I can see we've got 45 things in the chat. I haven't been looking as we've been going along, um, but I'm guessing there's lots of questions. So I'm happy to finish there. Um, I will do a little plug. Um, we do training through virtually all county associations now. Um, our standard VAT course is about twice as long as this. We do separate courses for back registered and unregistered councils to split them, uh, just make it easier. And we do special courses on partial exemption and other things relating to VAT as well. So if you need more, go to your county association as a starting point. Neil John will point you to me or to the appropriate person as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Steve. We have <laughs> had a bunch of questions, over, well over 30 questions. I have, Steve, I have sent you, we've tried, busy in the background, trying to summarise some of the questions into key categories. I've sent you an email containing a PDF. You can have a little look at that in preparation for the Q&A because we've had so many. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Nathan, who's going to give a, a brief overview of uh, Scribe and how they can help you. Thanks for that. And as mentioned, I won't take up too much of your time, but I just want to give a quick run through of our Scribe system for the benefit of any of you here today that aren't already users of Scribe. So I'll jump straight in and go ahead and share my screen here. There's just a couple of things that I would like to point out, first of all, about if you were to become a customer with Scribe, about the usage of the software and just being a customer in general. First and foremost, the website you see here is just our normal site, scribeaccounts.com. This is actually where you can come to sign in to Scribe. And that does mean, of course, that it's fully cloud 
cloud-based and in addition to that you can have as many users as you need for the system and those users can be set up with whatever permission levels that you wish to grant them whether you want to give people a read-only access or just add transactions or other examples that can go beyond that and then when it comes to your support while you're with us your support your ongoing support while you're with us is always included so there's a few different channels in which you can access that under the support drop down on our website where you can access the help guides, essentially our manuals to our system, and Scribe Academy where we host webinars on differing topics every week that you will always be free to join into. Then if I go ahead and sign into the software here, you'll see at the bottom right, I've got this button for support where I can type in my query, get responses on any of the articles in our knowledge base which may address it, but then hit the message us button if I then have a further query to that for any one-to-one -one support. So with those points out of the way, I just wanted to run through some of the main parts of our system that are worth being aware of, starting with the transaction section here at the top. This, of course, is where we can come to load on our payments and receipts. And if I click into payments here, you'll, of course, see all of the payments that I've already got loaded on. With the plus button at the top, I can load a new transaction where you can see that we can record information such as a minute reference to tie this to a particular meeting or, of course, assign it to a supplier. If you when you use this drop down to assign it to suppliers who you already have in scribe you can add new ones directly from here as well but we can then go to my crm system which i have at the bo bottom left of my screen where i can come to all contacts and add, for an example go to my own contact here and see all of the records that i've been assigned to throughout my use within the scribe system which is an easy way to track activity for one particular contact but I'll jump back to that new payment screen. The other parts on here worth mentioning is that with the payment details, splitting it down between the required cost centers and cost codes, we can break that down even further within a singular transaction if we need to, pointing it to different budgets within that single transaction. At the bottom, we also have drop downs where we can record any power or bylaws used for the spend of this transaction, which will then be recorded against it. And this checkbox for awaiting authorization as well, so that we can pull an authorization report towards the end. Coming back up to the top here, we can also record regular payments and receipts, just saving on this data entry that you've seen me run through here. But then if I jump into sales invoices in here as the final thing in the transaction section, this is where you'll be able to raise invoices within the Scribe system and actually be able to send them out as emails directly from here. And you'll be able to do that on bulk as well if you actually raise quite a lot of invoices at your council. Any invoices that you then have received payment for, you'll be able to come to the outstanding invoice and convert that over to a transaction automatically so that, that will add that in and update the payment status. Purchase orders work in a very similar way, but of course adding in payments instead of your receipts. Now, these invoices, of course, we can raise manually in Scribe as just an accounts package user. But I will point out that we do have modules available for our cemetery, bookings, and allotments packages, which all the activity in those packages will raise those invoices for you over in accounts. Again, just cutting down some of that admin where it's required. Then jumping in to the budgeting section here, this of course is where you can manage all of your different budgets, set up your cost codes, and set up all of their um, their budgets month by month and their forecast month by month. And then we have our budgeting report as the main report in here. This is going to break down our budgets and actuals for the current and previous financial year, along with a comparison into that next financial year, if we've opened that year and set the budgets for it. We then also have reserves where you can, of course, manage your reserves, and this will break down your capital and earmarked reserves, and then show you a summary of any spend and receipts that you have against those as well. Then moving into VAT, We'll see in here that I can generate my VAT form 126, enter the date range of the reclaim that I need to submit, which will default to the full financial year if you leave as is, and then we'll provide you with your 126 with Inscribe. Now, there's only one main difference if you're actually VAT registered, and that is that Scribe will then link with the Making Tax Digital portal, then of course generating your VAT 100 instead, and allowing you to submit that directly to HMRC from Scribe. So saving a lot of time, again, just on those little admin bits that you have to do without this. Now, there's many more reports available in Scribe. Of course, we can run through these in a lot more detail. I do encourage anyone who's interested to reach out and we can set up a one to one session where we can run through that in detail. But I'm now going to jump into the year end section here, which I've currently got set up for receipts and payments. And in here, of course, firstly, for the section two of our agar, I can jump in here, hit view report, and this will be provided for me uh, within the system. 
And then from here, off the back of the agar, for any variances, we need to provide explanations for. Now I can jump into explanation of variances. In here, it will give me text boxes for any of my variances that I need to provide explanations for, where I can then go to explanation report at the top right, come to view report, and this will then allow me to, once those explanations have been entered in, have a fully populated variances report. We also, of course, have your asset register inscribed as well. This can be imported from a spreadsheet, but this will summarize all of my assets, their acquisition date, purchase, current value, etc. We can also set their location using the What Three Words website if we wish to, and that will give us this little link which we can click onto to then open up the open up the location we've stored for that asset, and then generate our assets and investments report off the back of all of this data as well. Now. Just as a quick final thing for any of you who are actually accounting in income and expenditure, we can switch this over in Scribe to then generate all of our year end documents in income and expenditure. Now, one of the main things to be aware of is that day to day Scribe will still work in a receipts and payments format. And when you jump into year end and hit the calculate button, convert everything over into income and expenditure for you and then allow you to generate your annual return explanation of variances in all the same way but in the correct format along with recording all of your adjustments and summarizing that in your working document so i hope that's given a bit of an idea as to what's available in scribe if anyone does want to look in more detail i please do recommend just popping your details in the chat so we can then set up a session with you on a one-to-one -one basis and make sure it meet your requirements at your council but i won't take too much more of your time now. Enjoy the rest of your session and thanks for allowing me to run through Scribe for today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Nathan. So, Steve, did you get that email? I have. Thank you very much. That's that's very neatly organized and summarized for me. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll share that here. Uh, yeah, so we've got a few questions we tried to summarize. We've got so many questions. Um, are we okay for going over a little bit? in time uh, it, it's it's fine by me if everybody else is happy i'm, yeah, I'm yeah. used to people people asking but i, I ne never work on the basis that it's you know it's it's 11 o'clock and i must finish i you know i'd rather send people away happy so i'm going to whip through them as quick as i can there's one or two i might have to say it depends uh, and you may need to get further advice so if i start at the top um i'm going to skip the one about self managing trustee because that is a complicated issue in itself Okay, and I'll come back to that because I know there's another one at the end. Um, allotment plots. So if you are providing allotments, they're a non-business activity. So the cost of doing anything to provide allotments is related to your non-business activity and you can reclaim it. Uh, charging for use of a tennis court by a local tennis coach. Okay, so as far as we know with the sports rules now, it's the provision of a sports facility. So if you provide a tennis court, from the section 19 of the 1976 Act, it doesn't really matter who's hiring it to play tennis. As long as they're hiring a, tennis, a court to play tennis on, uh, as far as we know, that's fine. So it's still a non-business activity if it's kind of local people using it for local activities. We have had somebody say, what if, um, I think it was Swindon Town. Somebody has Swindon Town to hire their pitch for their training and stuff, and does that apply? We're not clear, but as far as we know, we think that still applies. It is the actual provision of the tennis court that matters rather than who is then hiring it that's, that's the issue. Um, leasing. So leasing rooms, land or buildings is normally exempt from VAT. doesn't matter who the customer is. It's the fact that you're providing a room or a building normally. So if you're leasing a, a room or a building to somebody else, normally exempt from VAT. Um, hiring hall for sports. If it's like a village hall, if it's a general purpose hall, it's not a purpose built sports facility. Um, you have to be providing more than just a hall with some lines on the floor. So if somebody, for example, is hiring the hall with a ball or with goals, and I was in a school hall the other day that had, you know, the goals are hung on the wall at either end and they just take them down and put them up. If, if you're providing equipment with the hall, it's a, it's a non-business activity because you're providing the equipment. If they're merely hiring a bare hall to do something, then it's still a VAT exempt supply going on as far as we're aware. Um, not sure about the one, changing use of changing washing facilities at the football club. Um, if somebody's hiring a changing room in connection with their use of a sports facility, it's part of the non-business supply of the sports facility. OK, if by washing facilities you mean showers and stuff like that, then um, 
yeah, that's that's part of the you know the ancillary features you get when playing football. Um, charging for use of the sports pavilion for children's football camps or providing refreshments. So it depends how you charge it. So if you are making a charge for the use of football pitches with changing facilities, etc., all in one, then that's non-business. If you're making a separate supply in the building, the question is why are you doing it that way? Because you're just making it awkward for yourselves. Um, but if you are making, you're probably making a separate exempt supply of the building if you charge so much for the pitches and so much for the building. But it probably doesn't make sense to do so. If you are charging for refreshments, um, then you're making a taxable supply of refreshments. If you're charging somebody else for a room to provide refreshments, then it's a VAT exempt supply of that room or whatever. Fireworks, I think I think I made that clear. If you if you're charging people for admission to an event, generally it's a taxable supply. You may need to register for VAT if it's sizable. You won't be able to reclaim VAT on the cost of the fireworks and all the other stuff unless you're registered. Hiring out a venue with its own car park, is that a type of note? So if somebody the main purpose is to have um, the village hall or an office building or whatever then it's not a separate taxable supply of car parking unless you start charging individually. So if you, if you charge somebody a thousand pounds up in the village hall, there's no supply of car parking within that if you get use of the building's car park. If on the other hand, you, you supply somebody with an office and they pay 500 pounds a month, and then you charge them 20 pounds a month for parking their car in the car park, that separate charge would be a taxable supply of parking. Um, charging the local school fees in the recreation ground, um, is going to be either either exempt or non-business and most likely non-business because it's under base if it's used for a sport as a sports facility. Capital project. So installation of an EV charging point. That depends. That really depends on uh, the arrangements that you're putting in place. I mean, if you're actually charging people for a supply of electricity, yes, it's a taxable supply, but it can be a very small amount. And in most cases, it's not the council making the electrical supply. Usually it's, you know, they're renting the unit to somebody else who is making the supply of electricity. So you would have to go to your county association and explain exactly what you're doing, how you're charging, who's doing it, to get advice on how that applies in a particular situation. Building new sports changing facilities. So if, if they're entirely used for hiring connection with um, Sports facilities, i.e. football pitches, tennis courts or whatever, then yes, you can reclaim VAT on the costs of those. You may not be able to reclaim costs if it's a building that also includes a meeting facility, like a, a meeting room that you can hire out to people and you're planning to use that as a, as if you like a, a mini village hall rather than just as, as changing facilities. But if it's purely changing facilities, you can reclaim the VAT on those if they're provided in connection with sports. Um, the, the same applies if you're refurbing a sports pavilion. You may have to split it if it's actually um, half changing rooms, half meeting room or something like that. If you're building a clubhouse and, you know, I've had people say they're building a clubhouse and they are building an enormous meeting centre and other people are building what's basically a glorified shed. So if you're providing a building for the club to have a home rather than providing changing facilities, um, if you're providing it for free, it's non-business. If you're leasing it to the club, it's probably still a VAT exempt supply and you're going to be restricted in your ability to reclaim VAT and you should take advice before doing it. Stalling a skate park, yes, it's non-business. I don't, I, very rarely have I heard of anybody trying to charge people to use a skate park. Um, and if you try it, they just break in and use it without paying you anyway. So um, if it's a non-business and you're not charging, as long as it is council provided and you're providing it on your site and funding it and you own it, that's fine. If you're trying to provide a skate park for somebody else, take advice because it can get tricky. Receipts. Uh, I make the first point, councillors should not be buying stuff on behalf of the council unless they've got resolution instructing them to do so. That's what the staff are there for. OK, so if a councillor has been authorised to buy something, they should get a proper invoice addressed to the council so you can reclaim the VAT back on it. Um, that receipt showing the gross cost, uh, as long as you can tell what the VAT is in, that should be included, you can still reclaim it, but they should actually tell you whether it's included at standard rate or not. 
If you have a receipt with no VAT number, you do not have the required information to reclaim VAT, and you should ask for a correct VAT receipt. Um, again, councillors councils are not entitled to expenses. You know, councillors' expenses will disappear. They're entitled to an allowance to cover their costs, but they're not entitled to buy stuff and come back and say, you need to pay me for this. Doesn't work like that. Again, they should have a resolution authorising them to do something, uh, and, not, and really they're trying to do the staff job for them. So councillors going out and buying what they feel like should not be happening. As long as it's addressed to the parish council or to part of the parish council, as long as it's for the parish council activities, it doesn't matter really if it's addressed to the leisure centre or the parish council office at a different address or whatever. Um, insurance claims is perfectly normal where you have an insurance claim, the insurer will pay the supplier, but your insurer cannot reclaim VAT. So if you can reclaim VAT, they will ask you to do it and they will ask the supplier to invoice you for the VAT involved. But the rules still apply. So if you were using the building for VAT exempt business purposes and you've suddenly spent £100,000 repairing it, you may not be able to entitle entitled to reclaim all the VAT back. So you need to check before you say, yeah, we'll just reclaim the VAT on it to make sure you can. Uh, VAT implications for council making pages at section S106 funding. It depends what you're spending on. If it's non-business like a children's play area, you can reclaim the VAT, you just treat it as your funding. If you use that section 106 to build a village hall that you then hire out, um, it's part of your VAT exempt business activities. Um, what have I got? Yeah, VAT, so VAT region, you don't need to register VAT if you're buying a free car park. Um, if you're providing electric charging meters, you'd have to be selling a hell of a lot of electricity to get to the point where you need to register for VAT. Um, I can't remember the trickle rates for those charges, but I think three or four charges being used constantly would barely get you to the point where you needed to register for VAT because of those supplies. But I've, as I said earlier, Take advice because sometimes it's not you making the supply anyway, it's somebody else making the supply. VAT implications of the community centre being partially that, well, if you make exempt supplies from a building, as I said with my little diagram, that affects your ability to, ability to reclaim VAT. You need to work out how much you incur on that community centre and indeed all the other buildings that you may provide to work out whether you exceed the £7,500 threshold or not. What to do if that should have been charged on the service but wasn't? Um, well, at least to a bowls club shouldn't have had, uh, um, shouldn't have had VAT on it, would be my reaction. Um, if you've made a mistake within the last four years, if you're VAT registered, you can correct it on your VAT return unless it's over £10,000, in which case you have to declare it. If you've made a mistake, if you're not VAT registered, you shouldn't be charging VAT in the first place. But again, if you've made a mistake, you can adjust it on your next VAT 126. Threshold for registration, I've already talked about that. So um, if you increase your um, charges to the point where you exceed 5,000 pounds or so, you're gonna, and they're taxable supplies, you may get to the point where you need to uh, register. What have you got? Handyman buying equipment for the council. So if it's an employee, employees are entitled to buy stuff on behalf of their employer as is in the course of their duty. And although it's the employee buying it and asking it for the money back from a HMRC's point of view, they treat it that when you or your employee goes to the shop, you are the council, you buy stuff for the council and the fact that they reimburse you with council money, we just treat it as you being the council and going out and buying it. If on the other hand, the handyman is a contractor and they're invoicing you for their services, then no, would be the answer, because, because you're not paying VAT to them, so you can't reclaim VAT when you're buying stuff for somebody else. If, if they say, will you buy it, and you buy it, that's fine, but if they go out and buy it and say, I've bought this, they're not your employee, they're in business on their own, VAT is their problem, not yours. Um, that I'll do the last one first, that implication of having a leasing place on the playing field, well, if you lease a sports field to a cricket club to pay cricket on, it's a non-business activity now because it's a sports facility. Okay, sole managing trustee of a community built hall, for example, if you were the sole managing trustee of a village hall or similar, you should manage it completely separately. It should have separate accounts, separate bank account. 
etc. So because the hall is used for the charity's business activity, the council is not entitled to reclaim VAT on costs funded from the charity's funds. And I've been careful what I say here. So you cannot reclaim VAT on using the charity's fund to refurbish the building. But if, as the council, you decide that you want to help the charity because it hasn't got any money and you're going to pay for a new roof or whatever it may be, and as the council, not as the trustee, you order and pay for the work using public funds, not charity funds, you should be able to reclaim the VAT in those circumstances, but not when you're using grants or funds received by uh, the trust. But in all cases, if you're in doubt, you know, and you're looking at hundreds of thousands of pounds for those that kind of work, do take advice. Go to your county association first, um, because as I say, we, we have a free arrangement, so it's free to you, it's paid for as part of your membership um, to make sure that you are doing the right thing, because if you lose your council's hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of money, they do get a little bit cross sometimes. And we have had the odd clerk cease to be employed because they've done something like that. There was a question I saw coming up, um, early on that I wanted to answer as well. So somebody asked about a uh, building or something. There is a lot, isn't there? Yes. What I was going to suggest, I don't know yet. I, I've been collecting all the questions, but it's gone a, gone a bit wild. Yeah, so we have over 50. Um, I could um, send them to you in a document if, you, if you're up for that, or you can have a quick look now. I would I would suggest, John, if, if people have, still have a query that, that we haven't covered in those, that they send them to their county association because, you know, somebody needs to be paying for me to spend all that time doing it. Um, and I can't ensure it, any advice that I give on the basis that I've given it through. Yeah. Sounds like a good list. plan. So, so um, you're, you're, yeah, so your paid uh, training, that normally goes through county yeah, we don't we don't market or advertise our training at all. It's all done through the county associations. Yeah. It gives us it gives a very nice lead in and filter for for you know them doing all the booking or people doing the booking, making sure. Um, uh, and it's it's the same training whichever county you go to. So like this, we will have a session with, you know, typically we'll have people from 15, 20 different counties all in the same session. Um, yeah. Cool. So everyone that's enjoyed uh, Steve's talk today, I recommend you talking to your uh, local Calc ALC just to recommend getting him to do an official training. And then all those questions can be answered because, yeah, there's still a lot of unanswered questions there. But we really appreciate your time today, Steve. Uh, if everyone could turn on their webcam and give Steve a wave to say thank you for all the uh, the, the great uh, talk he's given. And thank you very um, much. Yeah, the the uh, all the questions he's answered. Really appreciate your time uh, uh, taking time out to do this, Steve. Today, otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll be sending a video recording off it, and then we'll probably also ask Steve to do a guest post, uh, just summarizing this talk. Okay, cool. Have a really good day. Thank you very much. Take it easy. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank all. you very bye -bye. much. Bye bye.